Great. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to the session two of the annual meeting of the Alliance on Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, um, to the session Integrating Child Protection and Education in Refugee Settings. My name is Monica Martinez, and I'm the CP Mainstreaming and Integration Senior Specialist working for CPMS Working Group at the Alliance, as well as with the Unit CR Unit in Geneva. And I have the pleasure to facilitate this session today together with Laura, my colleague. Laura, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hello. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. My name is Laura Lee. I'm a senior associate with Protecnon Foundation for Innovation and Learning and a researcher in uh, child protection, education, and well being. Pleased to be with you all this morning, afternoon, and evening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Laura. So I was just, and I'm speaking for the both of us, I, we want to give you a really warm welcome today to the session, and we hope that you enjoy it as much as we have also enjoyed preparing it. Um, before we start, uh, can we have this slide where we see a little bit of the housekeeping rules? Yeah, this is the end of the session. Great. Then we go to this one. So just basically very, very core things. Be professional and work together. Respect confidentiality of others. Listen actively because this is a great opportunity for all of us to learn from each other. Uh, be open to meeting new people. Again, it's great. There's people, practitioners from child protection and other sectors for all over the world. So this is a great opportunity for that. Um, if you can feel comfortable and inter internet allows for it, just please turn on your camera. Laura and I would love to see your faces instead of just looking at the black screen. Uh, mute your microphones where you're not speaking so we don't have that uh, background noise. Be conscious of your surroundings and stay present. Again, this is a very interesting session and it would be really nice if you can stay present and engage with us. Um, as you might know from now, by now, we have simultaneous translation in three different languages. That they, well, English is the main language, but then we have simultaneous translation into French, uh, Spanish, and Arabic, which is great. Uh, but in the breakout rooms, we will not have that simultaneous interpretation. So if you would like to be, you'll, like, you'll have to want to have that uh, interpretation, apologies, just write your name on the chat box followed by us an asterisk and our great production team will help you to will, will take care of you in terms of facilitation. All right, so if we move to the next slide, we just wanted to give you a very quick outline and overview on how the session will run today so everybody's on the same page. We'll start first by an overview of the Alliance for Child Protection Human Action Strategy. This is the strategy that will guide our work for the next three years until 2025. So obviously very important for us. And concretely, in concretely, sorry, on a strategic priority number three, which is about multi-sector and integrated programming and collaboration among different sectors. Uh, we will also discuss a little bit on the difference between mainstreaming and integration as part of this session. And then we'll have the pleasure to move ahead with the second, the, the two great presentations that we have uh, prepared for today. The first one has been prepared by Save the Children Turkey, and it's on increasing education access and rotation among Syrian and Turkish adolescent girls and boys in Hatay in Turkey through the integrated programming. So really interesting. And then the and it's by Hilal Meliki and Bulent. I'll introduce them later properly. And the second one is brought us to us by Camila Fabri from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And it's on school violence, depression, and school climate among Congolese and Burundian refugee children in Tanzania. So as you can see, both of them super, super interesting. After the two presentations, we'll have some time for questions and answers to these specific presentations. So we'll have a little bit of time to ask our content leads about their, their experiences. And then towards the end of the session, then we'll do, we'll put you to work. <laughs> we'll do some work on breaking our rooms and then we'll be hopefully discussing and interchanging ideas about what are the main challenges uh, as well as the main um, mitigation measures or way forwards in terms of child protection, mainstreaming and integration across sectors. So this will be a little bit of work after uh, at, the, at the second part of the session. 
Um, I hope everything is clear until now. If there's any question, please let me know. I know sure I can see the chat, but yeah, that should be fine. And then if we move to the next slide, before we actually get to work, uh, we wanted to have a little bit of fun and get to, to know you a bit better. So if you see here, there's a couple of fun questions that uh, you are able to click the link uh, that you can see in the chat box. Uh, it will take you to a Menti um, link that then you can answer, you can tell us uh, about these two questions. Let me see if in the meantime, I can open my chat. Yay, that is. Is everybody able to ask us the, the link for the Menti question? So the first one is, yeah, what was your favorite game growing up when you were a child? Rounders. No idea what's that. <laughs> that sounds fun. Hide and seek, of course. Hopscotch. Dolls, yes. Under the soleil. Families, playing families, nice. Climbing trees, that was me too. <laughs> Racing and running, of course, football. Memory. Ooh, Nintendo. <laughs> Lots coming in now, of course. Jumping in paddles. That's uh, that's favorite of all times. Fantastic. Rayuela. That's a Spanish game. I know that one. <laughs> Great. Lots of nice, interesting games that keep moving. You think, Gilly, we can move to the second question? There is a second question for you that's equally fun. The question is, do you have any pets? And if so, what animal are they? What's your pet? What animal do you have at home? Cats, dogs, chickens. None, somebody has none. <laughs> Parrots, ooh, cool. Frogs. I have a total, I should put it in the chat. Zombie dog, what's a zombie dog? Hamsters. <laughs> Dogs, lizards. <laughs> lizards. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I say, oh, that's really sweet, yeah, the buccaneers. That's nice <laughs> because that just to play with you. That's lovely. We like this question of our childhood, no? It all bring us, bring it us closer to the theme today. All right, so that's lots of nice, interesting animals. The bunny, a rabbit, yes. Uh, what else? Birds, hamsters, ducks. No pets, unfortunately. Cows, that's a great pet to have <laughs> a cow. I love to have one. <laughs> All yeah. right, but this was really fun. Thank you so much for those that answer. I hope this was a little bit fun. And then I'm going to give the floor to Camila to continue with the, with the presentation. Um, to myself, actually. <laughs> oh, to Laura. Sorry, darling. Sorry, to Laura. Sorry, <laughs> my bad. Okay, um, back to the introductory slides, please. Um, thank you. Next slide. Um, great. Thank you so much for, for participating in that. Um, if you've been um, a part of any other sessions or engaged in any Alliance uh, work in the past months, you would be familiar with uh, the, with the strategy. Um, today, we'll be focusing on the third strategy, uh, even though there's interlinkages with several of them. So this is multi-sector and integrated programming and collaboration. The next slide, please. And the, the goal of this, um, the goal of this, uh, of this strategic priority is 
that children's protection and well being are prioritized within cross sector collaboration, including within multi sector and integrated programs and across all humanitarian action. And so this is what we'll focus on today. So if we keep this goal in mind, especially when we're doing uh, breakout room discussions later, that would be really helpful because anything that is spoken and documented today will be um, moving into operationalizing some of these plans. Um, okay, back to you, Monica, to, to go through the um, high level concepts around multi-sector and integrated programming, and then over to our first presenter. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, thank you so much, Laura, for that introduction. Um, can you hear me? It says that I'm mute, but I don't think I am. Yes, you can. Yeah. Okay, so we've been um, talking to months and we continue to, to talk about uh, mainstreaming and integration. And these are two different ways in which we can uh, strengthen our collaboration and the way we work with other sectors, colleagues, with education, with health, uh, livelihoods colleagues, but there is differences between the two terms. Um, and we, before we continue and unpack a little bit that, that terminology, we'd like to ask you, and again, we're gonna be uh, answering, going to the chat and answering one of those brilliant mentee questions that we like so much. Um, so please click the link and tell us what's the main characteristic of an integrated program. Uh, I don't see, yeah, okay, the answers are coming. One. Monica, could you share the link please again? Uh, I think it's link uh, is shared on the, on the chat box. Julie, is that possible? I can't see it, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's the same link as before, you just go to next question. Yes. Exactly. And there it is again. Thank, thanks, Julie. Thanks, Julie. Okay, so we are seeing numbers, number, answer number two, it's coming. Number three, holistic understanding. Response C doesn't have any yet. Okay. Answer B, the second one seems to be the winner. I've been told to go a little bit quicker because we're already eating up into the terms of the presentations, which are far more interesting than this. So thank you so much for your answers to all of you. To all of you. Then we can move, please, to the next slide, um, which so as the difference between the next one, please. This one, the main uh, difference between mainstreaming and integration, when we talk about mainstreaming, we mean that child protection and specific action are taken within another sector to do what? To promote the safe, dignifying and proactive environment of children and to uphold the principle of do no harm and centrality of protection by all of us humanitarian actions. And a good example of this could be, for example, a WASH program that is considered WASH, but it considers age, gender and disability status of children when and designing water and sanitation facilities in the school, or a health program that promotes menstrual hygiene management um, or includes basic training for health practitioners. And then instead, when we talk about integration, in a sense, we go up farther into collaboration across sectors by understanding the holistic and multidimensional needs of children. And then we do joint programming, joint assessment, joint indicators, et cetera. Um, and, a, and a good example of this could be, for example, a program that brings, brings together food security, child protection, education, and other sectors to reduce negative coping mechanisms like child marriage or family separation. From the Alliance strategy is intentionally focused on integration. We have an next slide, which you can see some of the objectives of poll number three, but uh, we're running a little bit late on time, so I'm not going to go through this, just to say that on the strategy, you can have a look at all these interesting ways in which how to make the goals operational. And without further ado, then I'm going to uh, click in the next slide, please, to introduce you the first abstract, which is uh, brought to us by Hilal Donel Meliki Aker Abulen Giser, all from Say the Children Turkey, and it's an increase in education access and rotation among Syrian and Turkish adolescents. So please go ahead with it and good luck. Uh, hi, dear guests. We are sending our greetings to you from Turkey. 
Uh, my name is Bülent Yüce. I'm livelihood specialist from Save the Children Turkey country office. Uh, today, me and my colleagues, Hilal and Melike, uh, we will be presenting our project to you. The project name is uh, Increasing Educational Access and Retention Amongst Syrian and Turkish Adults and Girls and Boys in Hatay, Turkey, uh, through integrated programming. And uh, we can proceed the next slide. Okay, hey, welcome again. And next slide, please. Uh, I would like to introduce our project region Hatay. Uh, can we proceed? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, now I would like to invite you uh, to go Mentimeter. Uh, please click the link you'll see in the chat box. And we are looking for uh, three answers and questions are uh, as follows. Uh, the first question is, uh, Turkey is host to world's largest refugee population since 2014. Option A, true, and option B, false. Okay. Yes, uh, you are seeing the first question. Turkey is the host, the world's largest refugee population since 2014. Is it true or false? What you think? <laughs> yes. Uh, the answer is true uh, because Turkey hosts uh, 3.7 million uh, Syrians under temporary protection. Besides, uh, there are other uh, 400,000 refugees who are Afghan, Afghans, Iraqis, and other nationalities. So uh, overall, Turkey is currently hosting above uh, 4 million refugees. And we can proceed to the next question. Yeah, Hatay province hosts more than 400 Syrians under temporary protection, which uh, you had a copy from the <laughs> previous question. Yes, uh, this is true. Hatay is the third rank considering the density of refugee population. It's really high. And the last question in Mentimeter, Afghan refugees in Turkey also entitled to temporary protection scheme rather than international protection scheme. Is it true or false? Yeah, I see that uh, it's almost equal, but uh, the correct answer is false uh, because Afghans are under international protection while Syrian refugees only liable to temporary protection. And uh, this was our Mentimeter question, so we can proceed to the next slide again. Thank you for sharing the Mentimeter session. Yes, we can pass the next slide. Thank you. Uh, Hatay is located in Syria and uh, Turkey border. Currently around 30% uh, of population is Syrian refugees, which is second biggest percentage uh, representing refugee and host community density in Turkey. Save the Children implement the PRM funded project with the partnership of Antakya municipality. Uh, Antakya is the central district of Hatay province. Uh, our programming focuses on strengthening child protection mechanism in Turkey by providing multiple services, including child protection, education, and livelihood. In this project, Save the Children leads three teams in Hatay. Those are child protection, education, and livelihood teams. Child protection teams uh, consist of social workers who conduct comprehensive child protection assessment and case management services, including MHPSS intervention by a trained psychologist. This team makes internal referrals to livelihood and education teams to support access to education and to combat child poverty. Differently in this design, education team works closely with the child protection teams and conduct initial child protection assessments. Next slide, please. Uh, so I will be uh, continuing uh, with uh, our overall activities and I will be mainly focusing on uh, how uh, we mainstream uh, child protection in our education programming. By the way, my name is Hilal Döner uh, and I'm working as education specialist in Turkey country office. So overall, uh, in our education programming in Hatay, uh, we have uh, a quite dedicated team of uh, 10 uh, education, uh, education officers 
teachers and we also have part-time teachers who are uh, mainly providing study groups, uh, individual support, for example, support for registrations, school registrations, uh, as well as equivalency processes. And we are also providing information dissemination and awareness raising uh, sessions uh, for teachers, for parents, caregivers, uh, as well as uh, as well as children. So uh, here uh, we will be also focusing on the rest of the activities, but we can say that we are mainly aiming to support a family uh, by targeting, by mainly targeting uh, out of school children or children at risk of dropout who are coming from uh, either host communities uh, or uh, refugee communities. So uh, we have uh, all these programs across sectors, protection, education and livelihoods. And I will uh, focus on uh, the education part as well. I can say that our team uh, like mainly works under the municipality because we are uh, based on the localization agenda, we are mainly working with the municipality, carrying out the project with the municipality as our partner. Uh, and in the very beginning of the project, in order to like raise awareness on uh, child protection issues and integrated programming, we trained our education staff on sort certain issues like child protection, child safeguarding, and other education focused programming, including uh, child friendly uh, child friendly classroom management, uh, as well as uh, accountability related to children. Uh, uh, and in the very beginning of the program, we assumed that uh, we will be only, <clears throat> uh, I mean, only child protection team will be receiving uh, referrals uh, and will be doing uh, child protection initial assessment. But however, uh, after uh, after we introduced the program, we received a high number of referrals, especially from schools. It was around 800, 900, etc. That's why our education team also started to carry out uh, protection assessment. But over there, we noticed that uh, they weren't that much knowledgeable uh, related to protection risk assessment. So this was something uh, challenging for us uh, in the beginning of the programming. And right after we noticed this, uh, our CP coordinator, CP specialist provided how to integrate uh, protection programming, how to mainstream certain activities in education programming. So uh, in the very beginning, that was a challenge. But later on, uh, uh, we think that we kindly reduce uh, this risk re related to our programming. And uh, Firstly, our design uh, did not include any social emotional learning component. And uh, as many of you guessed, this is quite uh, important uh, to prevent certain issues. And uh, in the first cycle of study groups, education team uh, referring a really high number of uh, children to protection team and a protection team as they are a quite small team, they couldn't meet the needs of the children. That's why we include a social emotional learning program just to prevent uh, certain risks. And as of now, we can see that uh, this is uh, kind of impactful on uh, well-being of the uh, children. So these are uh, mainly like our design related issues, capacity building related issues. We are still aiming for uh, more perfection, but uh, this is all I can talk about the program right now now and Melike over to you for the overall program activities. Thanks Elal. Uh, our child protection program includes case management and mental health and psychosocial support services. Uh, program team receive referrals and also internally refer children, caregivers and families to education and livelihood services. This internal referral process is very critical for child protection to implement a comprehensive intervention uh, with the support of education and livelihood activities. Um, by the way, I can't open my camera by myself. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Uh, to empower families and to create income generation, the livelihood activities target uh, parents, caregivers, and older siblings of children. Entrepreneurship Pathway aims to generate an income uh, via doing a micro business from home while employability pathway uh, focuses on providing an income by job placement. Melike, over to next, you. Next slide. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. 
Uh, in detail, you will see now in detail, chart prediction program provides case management services in line with the steps to protect common approach, which is basically case management approach of Save the Children implemented globally by Save the Children. As a part of the CP program, we have MHPS services focusing on level two and level three support at Interagency Standing Committee MHPS pyramid, uh, as you see, in that we establish children committee is at level two and provide focused PSS activities for children through adolescent emotional well-being curriculum at level three. Additionally, uh, parents, caregivers, and families are supported with the individual counseling program through uh, WHO intervention called Problem Management Plus at the same level. Uh, okay, so this was uh, a bit fast introduction to, to our project, but right now we will be forming uh, breakout rooms and you will be seeing our like real life, life scenarios or uh, challenges within our own project, because there are many things we couldn't talk uh, within this uh, small time, uh, small time. So right now we will have, uh, I guess, two breakout rooms and if you need interpretation, you can uh, just stay here in the main room. I would like to share the scenario two, um, which is about the, I'm sorry. So I will, I will share, right? Yep. Uh, so uh, we are discussing about the scenario two. Uh, you have established an integrated programming in collaboration with a particular municipality. However, your project is coming to an end in a few months. Uh, you are not experienced in handing over transition processes and you, you don't exactly know how municipality will sustain mm -hmm. certain activities by raising relevant funds. And these are our uh, discussing questions. What would be your approach to this? And what would be your solutions to this? Buland, it might be helpful to share the screen of the Jamboard now. Okay. I Should hope that this will be up in, in life. <laughs> I've actually made a copy. So uh, let me just reshare. Thank you. Because I think there were a lot of people in the other one. So okay. in the chat box, I'll just share this new link. And if everyone wants to come to slide two, you'll see scenario two. <laughs> there you all are. I see you joining. <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, the first comment, how would you design your project to increase the ability to carry out an integrated project? Think about objective indicators design. Yes. Uh, yeah, it could be planned at the beginning of project, but if uh, Maybe uh, this end, this kind of end, uh, it could be made a um, neat assessment. Uh, maybe first of all, we can identify who will uh, ongoing on behalf of a municipality uh, with the project. And what kind of capacity plan would you be developing? Yes, uh, maybe we can uh, look for a kind of local um fund source for the um, some capacity building trainings so if you're in the link if you um if you click on the fourth um button down on the on the left side of the screen you can make your own sticky note and type in responses and move them around under either question so you're welcome to participate that way and you're also welcome to turn your um, yourself off of mute and add a comment. If you put something in the chat, one of us can also add it to the Jamboard. Yes, exactly. For whoever doesn't know how to, it's not familiar with the post-it notes, you can also put something in the chat or just feel free to unmute and speak. I mean, we are all among colleagues here and we can make it happen on the board. Well, I put my um, my sticky note already there, but I don't know what you prefer to have a conversation or to just have the sticky notes. <laughs> That's fine, either way. Welcome, Piama. <laughs> conversation is welcome. <laughs> yes, please share. Yeah. 
Yeah, so then um, I just, uh, I mean, not rocket science, but um, just from from my work in different emergencies um, where you had to work uh, intersectorally, it's just so important to have a working group or whatever you call it, uh, where you all get together and you coordinate, because I think that's the most important thing when you uh, design a project that you actually have everyone who is supposed to be around the table, around the table. <laughs> Uh, and coordinate together. Yeah, sure. Thank you for your sharings. Um, I'm happy to go next. Um, I'm the one who put that uh, sticky note in there, which is full of grammar errors. But I guess from my <laughs> research, with my research hat on, I would probably think of doing some more work, like more um, like workshop style meetings where you really reflect on what are the activities of the program that you're building and how they sort of map out to outputs and outcomes that really cut across sectors and thinking about which could be outputs and outcomes that really overlap between different sectors and how you can sort of, whether they all cover um, sort of the, the integration aspects that you're, you're interested in. This is also, again, not very rocket science. Hello, can you hear me? Irene again. Irenia, we hear you. Hello, I will speak Spanish and I apologize. But I prefer to use Spanish, provided that there is interpretation available. In our experience, in our community work, what has been fundamental to integrate community boards, we have worked with schools, with families, and in extracurricular spaces as well. We have worked in reading spaces, in cultural spaces, so as to establish a diagnosis from a community perspective. We think that is something that would allow us to establish a needs diagnosis. And that is a practice that has worked very well for us so far. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your share. Yes, uh, community work is very important of important part of this. Uh, yeah, assessment of needs. Sure, sure, Monica. Hi, friends. Uh, I don't know if I could maybe pitch in and contribute something from my side. Um, it's great to see everybody, even if virtually. And uh, I'd like to build on what uh, Fiamma said. I think the coordination, and again, coming from uh, some tricky deployments and experiences. The coordination is really helpful, but the key word for me is, would be sustainability. Uh, and sustainability, I think, as a, a part of that discussion within a coordination workshop or forum, should probably speak to who might take responsibility for what. And I think a lot of the time, things are not delimited and broken down. So people have great intentions, but as we all know very well from any sort of applied work, uh, things can break down very easily. So I think delimiting responsibilities and saying, look, how do we make this process sustainable when all the big guns and all the, you know, the, the fancy feet have left? How do we actually make this workable so that it, 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 it results in, in a sustainable impact? So that word for me would be, would be key sustainability based on delimiting responsibilities. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your sharing, yeah. Uh, actually, I think it's also uh, linked with the capacity of a uh, partner because um, in, some, in some partners in uh, Turkey, the, I mean, their capacity is not enough for the, for the uh, conducting a project. So if you, uh, Actually, we prefer to make a kind of partner assessment before the project. Uh, in this way, we uh, try to identify uh, they can go on or not with themselves. Uh, so it, yeah, it affects uh, project capacity, sustainable timing. Actually, maybe um, I have also another point. I put it uh, there in the jump board, but um, for me, um, inclusion and local knowledge and system strengthening, which is, I think, kind of uh, coming a bit from um, also the sustainability aspect, I think is really, really important because um, from what I've seen in different contexts, I think, yeah, I would say 
it doesn't really matter uh, in which culture or which continent, but um, anywhere where you have to obviously work with government and local systems. I mean, we're we're kind of guests when we come to a country, right? And often, I think in humanitarian settings, um, um, we might not uh, behave as such always. Um, then maybe parallel systems can kind of uh, come up. So I think um, inclusion of local partners and really respecting local um, knowledge, um, because when we come to a, an emergency setting, for example, or any any setting, we're new. And even though we think we know a lot, I think um, just respecting and being inclusive with local knowledge, local um, capacity, um, and if we want to strengthen and strengthen local capacity, I think that's really important when we want to have integrative project as well, and in terms of sustainability. Uh, Bülent, by the way, group one uh, is here already. I just wanted to inform you. Okay. <laughs> Welcome group one. <laughs> so uh, should we press the link? Ah, okay. Yeah, there, there's still another minute remaining, so carry on. If there's anything else you'd like to add to scenario two, please feel free. Thanks a lot. Uh, group one, you are so lucky you have seen two scenarios. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. On my own side, Sierra Leone. Uh, when we talk about um, uh, collaboration in um, uh, the community, before you establish um, uh, a particular project, all you need to do, you need to do the, the service mapping. When you do service mapping in the community so that when you are implementing a project because you cannot provide everything in the issue of child protection so you do prefer us you link with other people in the, in the same sectors that you are working with so having done this ma, MA community mapping when you started doing your project you see at the end you will succeed but if you just go and implement a particular project without doing a community MA mapping or map or service mapping in your project, sometimes I mean, you find out at, at the end of the implementation of the project, you will not tend to achieve any result because most of the, the things you're supposed to produce or to provide for the child needs, you do not have them. So if you establish the, the service mapping in the initial stage of the project, you will achieve at the end of the project. That's my, my contribution. Uh, thank Thanks a lot, Benjamin. It was a really great point to hear. Yeah. We are also trying to like consider uh, this as well. And uh, if it's done with the participation of community, it can be more and more meaningful, as we already uh, discussed in the groups as well. May I ask, the last group uh, is uh, within the main room or not? Melike, are yes, you there? Yes, everyone is back. Okay, so Melike will be doing the final reflection and uh, wrap up. Thanks, Ida. Shall, shall we show the screen, Jamboard screen again uh, in the wrap up part? Um, can I share my screen or can you share? Uh, Mel Melike, I think we only have two minutes. Uh, you can okay. start and I can share it same. Okay, perfect. Um, what we discuss in our groups, we, um, the first group, the, when you see the sticky notes, we can. Sorry. Yeah, what we see, and um, there is training, more training on case management SOP, time to supervision and follow up, community involvement uh, come in the first discussion. Uh, if we mo move to the next uh, scenario, Hilal, here we have capacity building and community involvement again with the uh, with the time to supervision and follow up if you move to the next slide next page Hilal. Uh, here we have um, fgds child involvement community hotline more trainings and confidentiality measures mainly uh, our approach is mainly focusing on partnership with the MHPSS, uh, MHPSS uh, actors in the region, and then uh, child participation in place to contextualize effectively the programs. And for the risk mitigation part, we focus on confidentiality. Yes, in all three scenarios, if 
what we can say is mainly training, timely supervision, follow-up, training on case management, training on MHPSS and community involvement is the main conclusion we can say. Uh, thank you for contributing to our presentation and listening to us. It was all nice to meet you all. Um, yeah, I think time's up now. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Save the Children Turkey team, for this fantastic both presentation and good work. Now I'd like next to introduce our next presentation with Camila Fabri that will be talking about school violence, depression, and school climate among Congolese and Burundi refugees, children in Tanzania. Please, Camila, all yours. Thanks, Monica. Um, thank you. So um, uh, my name is Camila Fabri. I'm a researcher at the London School, and I am presenting the results from a study that explores the relationship between school violence, depression, and school climate among Congolese and Burundian um, child refugees um, in, ref in a refugee setting um, in Tanzania. Um, next. So the study took place in Nyarugusu refugee camp in 2019. Nyarugusu is one of three camps in the Kigoma region of Tanzania. And at the time of the study, the camp hosted around um, 150,000 um, refugees, of which more than half were Congolese uh, refugees who had been in the camp since its establishment in the mid 1990s. Um, and around 70,000 uh, were Burundian refugees who had been arriving since the conflict broke out in Burundi in 2015. Um, in 2020, both uh, crises in the DRC and the Burundi were listed among uh, the world's most neglected displacement crisis by the Norwegian Refugee Council. So we are um, therefore in the context of a protracted and severely underfunded uh, humanitarian crisis. Um, so next uh, slide, thank you. Um, this um, setting of Nyarugus refugee camp, as uh, many other refugee um, settings, is characterized by situations of overcrowding, both within among the population, but especially within schools, um, a general lack of security, severe resource constraints, and um, in general, weak uh, protective and referral structures. Um, and while we all know that these are um, very known risk factors, um, for violence against children in humanitarian settings, official data on the prevalence of various forms of violence and abuse from these contexts is very scant, and we tend to have to rely on anecdotal evidence uh, most of the time. And the, the lack of rigorous um, data um, on, on violence against children um, hinders our ability to really uh, effectively design pre prevention and response programs in, in these settings. Um, so next slide, thank you. Uh, so before we look in more detail our uh, some of our prevalence rates um, for violence against children in Yarugusu, I wanted to um, look at some numbers together just to get a sense of what is the prevalence of violence against children in some other stable uh, contexts in, uh, in East Africa, just to get a sense of sort of what numbers we're, we're usually looking at. Um, so we can move to the Mentimeter now, where you'll find um, two questions asking you um, what is the proportion of youth aged 18 to 24 who has experienced um, physical violence prior to age 18 in Rwanda, and then a similar question asking you what proportion of youth aged 18 to 24 has experienced sexual violence prior to age 18 in Uganda. Um, so if you move to the Mentimeter, um, you can, I think, vote um, by females and males, um, respectively. Yeah, Camilla, you can comment on, on this response and then let them okay. know when to go to the next question. Okay, well, I'm gonna, uh, I just want us all to sort of look at what, uh, what is coming up. So it looks like 60% is the most popular response for female girls, female, um, female girls reporting um, experience of physical violence. In childhood in Rwanda, we can move to the next one um, and see what um, what you think is the is the prevalence for boys of um, sexual violence um, in Rwanda. So obviously, we're talking about state somewhat stable settings, and um, the these estimates that I'm going to share with you come from national representative surveys. So we're talking across the whole population of the country, and not. Um, not in uh, specifically not in refugee or humanitarian settings, but 
interesting to see how that people have quite different um, views uh, or guesses, uh, unless anyone already knows the answer. So we can move to the following um, two questions. It feels like 60% tends to be one of the popular um, options. Um, also, just to flag that we here we're talking about um, any violence from reported from any perpetrator. So we're not focusing on any specific setting or on any specific perpetrator. So we're talking across household, school, any other community environment that these children that these kids may have ex have experienced as children. Again, we tend seems to that the answer again is sort of in between 60 and 70, 74%. Um, I guess we can go to the last one. Um, interesting to see that sort of people tend to tend to um, click on that sort of 60%, around 60% um, option. Okay, I guess that there's a great, okay, a few think is a bit lower when you talk about um, Uganda this time, but yeah, again, so people think maybe in this, okay, cool. Um, maybe we can go back to the main slides. Um, thank you everyone for um, joining the, the vote or the guests um, or your reflection. Um, we can go to the next slide, thank you. Okay, so thanks for, for voting. So these are the answers to the questions that um, we, I asked you. So um, based on the most recent nationally representative uh, VAX surveys um, that we have available, we know that in Rwanda, 37% of females and 60% of males reported experiencing childhood physical violence from any perpetrator. And in Uganda, we have about 35% uh, of girls and 17% of boys who reported um, experiencing sexual violence um, in childhood. Um, so these are just some numbers to give you a bit of like context um, in terms of other, other prevalence estimates from, again, stable settings in, in East Africa. Um, and we also know from global evidence um, that has been collecting um, all these nationally representative data from these uh, various nationally representative surveys that teachers and peers appear to be uh, common perpetrators of violence against children when we uh, focus our analysis on looking at where the violence takes place and at the, at the hands of, of whom. So we can go to the next um, slide. Um, so in 2019, um, we conducted the, what we call the PVAC study, uh, the Preventing Violence Against Children's in School study, um, to assess the effectiveness of a school-based um, violence prevention intervention in primary and secondary schools in Yarugusu refugee camp in collaboration with colleagues at the International Rescue Committee. Uh, in the context of this, uh, of this study, we conducted three rounds of cross-sectional surveys with students and teachers in all the schools in the camp. And uh, what I'm going to do now is to present some of the results from our baseline survey. Um, so with our baseline survey, which we ran in 2019, we aim to do um, several things. First, we wanted to estimate the prevalence of violence against children from teachers and peers. Um, we wanted to estimate the prevalence of depression symptoms among students um, in the camp. And lastly, we wanted to explore uh, the relationship between school climate and, and student outcomes. Next slide, thanks. So what I'm showing you here, um, and sorry for the small numbers, um, is the prevalence estimates that we calculated of uh, uh, violence against children in Yarugus refugee camp. And as you can see across um, the table, um, children in the camp experience very high levels of violence in school. Um, when we look at data um, um, in terms of violence from, uh, from teachers, we see that more than 80% of students um, reported experiencing some form of physical violence from teachers uh, in their lifetime, and 56% reported physical violence from teachers in the past week. Um, this estimate became, uh, reached 59% um, in primary schools. 18% um, of students reported the experiencing emotional violence from teachers in the past week, and generally we found little differences between boys and girls. Um, overall, 3% um, of students reported experiencing sexual, some form of sexual violence from teachers in their lifetime. <coughs> And this is, um, this is a bit higher than other contexts um, 
in which we uh, measure sexual violence with the, with the similar tool, while the data uh, on physical and emotional prevalence is very similar to other settings in which we used um, a, similar, a similar survey tool. Um, when we look at uh, violence from peers, we see that 14% uh, um, reported physical violence from students um, and peers uh, in the past week, and about 15% reported um, experiences of emotional violence. Um, again, both, uh, um, um, both physical and emotional violence um, where uh, prevalence estimates were similar between boys and girls, but they tend to be much higher in primary schools. Finally, around 8% um, of students um, screened positive for depression symptoms in this context. So we are in a, in a setting where um, children are experiencing very high levels of violence in uh, school settings. Um, and we know from, um, from qualitative uh, studies that we've conducted um, in, this, in, this, uh, in this camp before that um, violent discipline and corporal punishment are very um, acceptable, are perceived as very acceptable um, forms of, of, of discipline in, in Yarugusu schools. So that sort of explains some of these, um, these numbers. Um, so we can move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, um, globally plenty of evidence uh, that shows that positive school environments are beneficial for students um, and that a good school uh, climate can influence a host of outcomes for children, such as their economic, uh, sorry, academic outcomes, academic performance, risk of violence um, and mental health outcomes. Um, we also know that um, a positive school climate is particularly important for children who are at increased risk of feeling alienated or isolated which is likely to be the case for displaced and refugee children. Um, and while the vast literature on the school climate has somewhat failed to uh, produce a universally accepted list of, of dimensions of school climate, um, we, in line with some, some previous, uh, pre some previous uh, um, studies, we identify the four main dimensions of school climate using um, teacher, teacher self-reported um, data. So we, we define school climate as the quality of relationships between teachers, students, and parents, um, as teachers' job satisfaction and well-being um, in the school. Um, we also included a dimension related to teaching practices um, and teacher self-efficacy in the classroom. And finally, we included um, uh, opportunities for involvement in decision-making um, that exist uh, within the schools for teachers and, and, and students as well. Um, so we can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so we, re re we really relied on this conceptual conceptualization of, of school climate to understand what is the association between school climate and, and student outcomes. And we looked specifically at two outcomes for students. So, uh, one is their experiences of, um, of uh, violence in the school, and the second one is their um, depression symptoms. And what we found was that higher involvement and apologies this looks a bit tiny uh, tinier than I than I expected but what we found is that higher involvement of teachers and students in decision making within the school was actually associated with higher levels of violence from teachers as reported um, by the students um, and secondly that higher teacher self-efficacy was associated with lower odds of depression among students so how do we really interpret these results well in a context Context like Narugusu, where corporal punishment is perceived as an effective and acceptable form of discipline, it's possible that um, increasing opportunities for teachers and students to contribute to decision making um, within the school may actually result in higher levels of violence. And instead, in schools where involvement of students and teachers is limited and where the decision making maybe um, um, is limited um, more sorry, is, uh, is, um, um, is heavier and, uh, and, and taken care by um, school administrators in line with um, uh, camp uh, um, regulations, uh, the use of violence may be actually less common. Um, the other, the second um, result that we have is, um, which is around the association between um, self teacher self-efficacy um, and, uh, and lower um, depression among students. Well, this is 
quite in line with the previous evidence that um, suggests that schools where um, there are more structured disciplinary styles and where teachers feel let, more supported and more confident about their own skills and their own ability to manage the classroom may be better able to support students' emotional um, and mental health well-being. Um, and so while well, at the first look, maybe both findings seems quite um, um, uh, surprising, they are very much in line with the, with the available um, evidence from, from other, other contexts, which is although fairly limited and does not come from any um, refugee or um, humanitarian setting, there has been very exploration around this um, dynamic in these, in these settings. So just to conclude, I wanted to try and highlight how sort of um, these study fundings um, can inform um, um, design um, and, and, and integration of child protection into education service provision. So we can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so what, what we see is that yes, schools can be and uh, safe and protective environments in most uh, contexts, but we also have increasing evidence that tells us that teachers and peers are frequent perpetrators of, um, of violence against children. And therefore we need to consider um, how local norms around violence influence teacher and student behaviors, um, because some of these fundings do challenge our, our understanding of, of the role that schools can play uh, in the lives of refugees um, refugee um, children. Um, schools offer an ideal platform uh, for violence prevention and response, not only because a lot of the violence that children experience in these settings is in the school, but also because, um, especially in protracted crises that are correct characterized by higher enrollment rates, higher school enrollment rates. Obviously, schools are, now, are a platform where you, that allow to reach a large number of children. Um, from our data, we also observed that younger children, at least in this context, were more at risk of violence from teachers and peers. So maybe in terms of like prioritization of, of programs, um, primary schools and lower levels of education may be, um, may be um, considered a priority setting. And finally, the findings around the pressure rates uh, among students and the importance of teacher self-efficacy as a protection factor um, against, against student depression uh, points towards the, the need for um, integrating uh, violence prevention and response interventions with the, uh, the provision of mental health support, psychosocial support and counseling, not only for children, but also for teachers. Um, so I'm concluding today um, here with a few references. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for listening and very, yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure to, to be here again. Thank you so much, Camila. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, so as I understand, we could go back with the program. Now we have five minutes for questions and answers. So please just feel free really to either just paste your question on the chat or just unmute yourself and ask our content length panelists are here to and we'll be very, very pleased and very happy to answer any other questions you might have about their presentations. So don't feel shy and unmute. <laughs> Someone is, Alison is asking if we could share the slides and also the tools. So I guess, yes, the answer is that we'll be doing that with the package in the Alliance. Megan is asking the same, if Camila uh, slides will be available, so yes. Yes, thank you, Yuli. So the slides and all the presentations will be um, shared in our filler space. So for everyone to be able to access. Oh, I see some hands coming up. Alison, please, would you like to unmute yourself and talk? Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, everybody. Um, I'm not sure if you could see me. Maybe. Yeah, it's okay. Um, yeah, such an interesting presentation. Thank you. I'm Alison Jonah from I'm the Education and Emergencies Technical Lead for Plan International. Um, so happy that I joined this session. I'm really interested to know more about that finding that more teacher involvement leads to higher levels of violence. I didn't quite follow your logic. Um, and it's very concerning from the point of view of someone who normally would expect that if you work with teachers and involve them more, you will be closer to achieving your goals. So I'd be really interested to hear more about how you interpret your interpretation of that finding. Can I go? 
Okay, um, so I guess that in uh, what we what we understand is that in this set in this setting, when we speak to teachers, teachers teachers and actually also students we have plenty of qualitative evidence that shows this is that there is an expectation that a good teacher um, beats children and uses the stick and canes them in the classroom this is something that is not only expected um, from children who say a good teacher will do this because a good teacher who cares about me will show me the way of how I need to behave and like show me when I am misbehaving. But teachers also um, believe that using caning and using the stick are very much uh, one of their main tools that they have access to, to shape futures, what good future citizens. There's a lot of conversation in our qualitative data about this idea of shaping well-behaved citizens for the future. So what we think is that in schools on average, in schools where teachers and students are more involved in sort of shaping policies and shaping how decisions are made, made it's possible that this very um, this high acceptance of violent discipline actually results in, in a propensity towards use of violence. While the since the since violence uh, as a violence and corporal punishment formally are prohibited in the camp, uh, in schools that instead involve less teachers um, and students in this process of decision making, it's possible that school management just tends to follow more strictly the camp regulation and the school regulations that prohibit the corporal punishment and may be less inclined to promote this type of behaviors. <clears throat> Obviously, um, we our measures for, for, for school climate domains are not perfect, um, but this is sort of what we have um, um, hypothesized in collaboration with our colleagues in, in the camp. And so is IRC working with teachers on this? Yes, yes, we are very much so working um, across all schools, um, doing a lot of research to understand sort of norms, but also to understand how to design effective preventing um, violence prevention measures um, within schools. I've posted uh, the link to our research group in the chat um, where you can see all our studies um, mm -hmm. and you can read some of our other findings as well. Thank you, Alison. This is well, this is super interesting. And Camila, I'm just gonna give there's two more hands raised up. So I'm gonna give the floor to Aida because I think we have one or two minutes and she's been waiting a little bit. So Aida, please would you mind to share your question with us? Hi, sorry. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for the presentation. Sorry, I thought I had lowered my hand because my question was exactly the, the question that Alison um, just asked. I uh, just wanted to have some clarification. I, I wasn't sure I had understood the, the interpretation. Um, so thank you so much. All right, then. <laughs> thank you to you. Then it's also Yusuf from GSF that's been raising his hand or her hand. Yes, yeah, so, so yeah, so I think my own question is related to the violence prevention in the school. So, is that the, the, uh, my, I would like, I like to get a clarification if the research is conducted after or before uh, a child self guiding training is conducted to the teachers. Do you, does, do, do, is any question related to that or? You, you, the, you, are, you, are, you have no idea whether these very teachers were being trained on child self guiding issues. Over. Um, thanks. So uh, this data that I showed, the prevalence estimate, these are our baseline surveys. Uh, so these were all conducted uh, before um, our um, before we entered school with a violence prevention program. Um, Obviously, there are other efforts, sort of ongoing efforts in the camp around sensitization, around use of violence and so on. But these were specifically um, measured before a big, big um, sort of engagement and program that specifically targeted teacher violence. I would say that, um, yeah, they were a, a pre-measure. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. So if that answered the question, I think we're gonna move on to the next exercise and apologies for being so rushed, but you know, time is the time we have. But there is some questions, Camila, Hilal, 
Kula and all the other uh, colleagues that have presented today. There's some questions on the chat, so we will be happy also to answer them there. And of course, we'll also be sharing their um, email addresses and everything so that they can, if there's still some burning questions that you'll ask to ask them, you can get in touch with them. Um, could I have please the next slide of the presentation, please? Thank you, Yuli. Okay, so now after seeing our panelists uh, work, it is time for us to work ourselves. So you will be divided in, in groups. And I think we have around 10 groups of around five people. And we'll be asking you two questions. One is to think about what do you think that are the three main barriers for a city mainstreaming into other sectors? You can choose the sector being education, health, whatever you think, at the inter INC coordination level, and what are also the main suggestions that you put forward for mitigation. Then the same question, but not in, at the inter INC coordination level, but more into the pro programmatic uh, side of things. So what are the bar barriers for inter um, city mainstreaming and integrated um, 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 programming uh, design of programs? And what are the main uh, ideas or suggestions to, to mitigate those? Uh, you will be working in a small groups, so please we'll ask maybe one person in the group, one volunteer that is able to uh, work on the on the uh, set on the screen the Jamboard uh, link that we have provided, and then there's two ways that you can as before you can participate just by like. Uh, you know, writing in those uh, post-it notes and put them around and also, but just basically unmute yourselves and speak. There will be very small groups. So, you know, uh, please just open, unmute and participate. After that, we'll come back in plenary. We won't, don't have a lot of time for each group to present, but we'll ask you to please circle some of the big ideas, some of those main ideas that you come out after debating, after discussions, what are the most important things that you have sort of discussed in your groups and then as a plenary, we'll try to make sense of all of that and discuss a little bit. Is this clear the instructions of the, of the breakout rooms discussions? Does anyone have any question? Otherwise, we'll just follow the, your, your arrow that will take you to the breakout rooms. Great. And you'll have about seven or eight minutes with your Ah, group. yes. And also we forgot to say that uh, everything that you write on there, it's really, really um, super useful for us and it will be documenting and it will be helping to uh, shape the strategy planning for the Alliance. So yeah, seven minutes to work. <laughs> like. <laughs> Okay, the rooms are open. People are uh, popping into them. We've generally got four to five in each room and we've got a small group staying here. So please, those of you who stayed here, feel free to take advantage of the interpretation. And uh, Monica, if you want to lead the way, would you like me to share your screen or would you like to share your own? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's better that you do. No problem. Because I have like so many open things that I don't really know what it is anymore. I hear you. No problem. <laughs> mm. There you go. How's that? Okay. So, yeah, that's fine. It's a little bit small for me to read, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who else is in the room? Can I ask the, the people that is in this room to maybe put on their cameras if they feel comfortable about it? Oh, I see Camila and I see Alex, but I don't see anyone else. We should have Yvonne, William, Rosaline, Momadou, Jean Didou, Miriam. Oh, Laura is back here. I thought Laura was in the room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's just uh, uh, talk about the first one. Has some. What are the main three um, barriers that we as practitioners face when we are trying to do inter-coordinated responses at the, at the, um, at the entire C level? Okay, I'm happy to write what you tell me to write. Yeah, folks, feel free to unmute yourselves. This is a discussion. <laughs> Can you turn on your videos even. Uh, Monica, I, I can have uh, a few words related to this. Please. For instance, uh, sector based, we are having like different education working groups, but till uh, one year ago, 
uh, we didn't have some CP colleagues in our education working groups because uh, like child protection mainstreaming has been almost always important in education sector, but at uh, like uh, interagency coordination level, we lack that type of participation. Right now they are taking care of it, they are considering it, but this is a kind of barrier like education sector working group does only uh, include uh, people working in education sector but we also need like exchange uh, of idea sessions etc at the coordination level i think so if i have understood hilal you mean that this education sector other sectors but there is not yet a very well established mechanism for them to speak to each other or to work together yes this can be developed further uh, in turkey context i'm not quite sure uh, sure about the other context maybe you uh, all the participants can provide uh, some further examples on issues yes i mean what i think that has worked well i mean i agree with you one of the main uh, barriers for interagency coordination is to really understand uh, because when we talk about child protection we are child protection practitioners so we have an understanding a terminology that we use um, but sometimes it's difficult for us also to put ourselves uh, in the other sectors and to understand what education does, what livelihood does, what uh, water and sanitation does. I mean, not an uh, like superficial understanding, of course we have, but really what are their processes? What are their ways of working? What are the main strategies? So I think one very important thing for us to, to break or as a mitigation is to be able to really go deeper into understanding uh, the ways of working, the strategies and the outcomes of each other so that then when we actually want to design programs, we don't come only from our child protection understanding, but we are sort of more uh, acquainted or more like uh, knowledgeable of what others are doing. So in terms of, for me, like uh, sort of a joint capacity building or joint uh, understanding of each other's um, working groups, uh, um, uh, ways of working, it would be very important. I'm not sure if we are actually writing on the board. Should I be doing that? Yes, please. <laughs> but I can't. I can't. Um, do you have the board find... open in on your screen? Oh, go to slide ten. We're in ten. Oh. Ah, okay. I was gonna say yeah. No, Plenary ten. <laughs> it's not taking me there. You you hit the the arrows. Yes, but it's not. Where is it taking you? <laughs> Nowhere. It's not taking me anywhere. Sorry. That's all right. Um, do you, can I can't even like it's not letting me to click the post-it notes. I'm not I sure mean, why. here I tell me what you want me to write. Yeah. Okay. So basically. Um, uh, education sectors finding the ways of understanding what are the main uh, what other sectors are working on and what are the priorities and the strategic ways of working so we can learn from each other. Yvonne, do you have anything to say? You raise your hand. Yes. Um, yes. So I wanted to contribute to the second, I think it's the second uh, question on the programmatic barriers. And uh, one of the things that I've seen we struggle with is uh, the interpretation of skill. Child protection uh, often we want to, usually child protection concerns are complex, right? So if you want to ensure access to school, for example, um, you have to work around so many different barriers to education or barriers to access to ensure that the child is able to attend school. So I'm giving education as an example. So in trying to integrate uh, at least at the level of programming, uh, you may find that other sectors can easily scale their interventions because it's, it's, it's about, could be about increasing the number of classrooms, could be about increasing the number of teachers, and the numbers are high and they can easily scale and rapidly. But then uh, from the child protection perspective, uh, scale in terms of numbers is often not a win point for us. So if you have a program that wants to reach, I don't know, 10,000 children, child protection will be thinking, okay, of these children, uh, we need to have some intensive program or case management or some response to be able to ensure that they can meaningfully access. And so our numbers are so low 
because we have to do so many different things to ensure that the child is, is well for them to attend school or to attend different types of uh, uh, programs, whether it's livelihoods, you know, we have to think about the family, we have to ensure that uh, if it's about income generating, it's sustainable. And uh, many times I find that there's that friction between in, in terms of interpretation of scale when other sectors interpret scale as numbers and we interpret scale as being able to ensure there's um, within the catchment area, if I use the term catchment area, that there is service available and meaningful service available to children. So usually that tension is something that we struggle with. Oh, breakout rooms are closing in 30 seconds. Oh, sorry, what, would you like me to put something on a sticky note there? I don't, tell me how you'd like me to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that one, like scaling up. Validate. Is not so, yeah, scaling up is not often so possible for child protection. So programming has to be designed in a holistic way. And also in terms of, she was talking now in terms of targets. Um, targets sorry. Base. Difficult. For, yeah, maybe if you put it in the, oh, here we go. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Perfect. In the chat is great. <laughs> yeah, it's also the other one. I'm so like, I don't know how to summarize yeah, any no, of this. I know. I know. I'm sorry. Not my area. <laughs> Thank you, Yuli. Sure. I really don't know what, yeah, what happened with why I couldn't okay. click on that. Anyway, everybody's okay. back now. Yeah. Everybody's back, Monica. So, Laura, please. Yes, thank you, Julie. Um, thanks, everyone, for your participation in the breakout rooms. I popped into a couple and saw some great discussions happening. Um, we just have a few minutes to conclude. Um, Julie, I wonder if you could uh, display the Jamboard again. Sorry, you just took sure. it off. <laughs> no worries. Just, I'll go back to room one, shall I? <laughs> let's just look at a few of the responses that have come up. Um, uh, what what we were um, seeing across some of the slides was the need to break down the, the siloed approaches. Um, here we have the reporting mechanism um, being the main challenge. Um, I think what we'd like to do is, um, I think there's time for um, perhaps one group to just share some something, um, a big idea. Would someone from room one like to to share a main uh, reflection from here. I can step in. Uh, actually, we didn't have so much time, so we didn't have a lot of ideas. But first, for the main barrier, we discussed this uh, difficulty in uh, reporting mechanism. Uh, so uh, if it is... Uh, uh, it's very challenging to make it really um, effective and uh, timely, timely done in, in time. So this is where uh, we can, it, it's one of the main barriers of child protection mainstreaming. And I can as well add one. I didn't have the chance to, to discuss it with the team. However, I think that uh, the coordination mechanism is done by sector. So this is why it's very difficult to mainstream because uh, either we, we are all together in the same room to discuss uh, what's the concerns, all the concerns, or each sector will take it for, for its own um, results and outcomes. And this, this is, for my, from my side, I can, I can see it as a main barrier. From the second barrier regarding uh, um, at the programmatic level, uh, we had a discussion regarding the awareness on ch of children among children on when and to whom reporting and uh, how children are able to identify if this is an abuse or just a discipline and the discipline that is um, socially accepted. So mm -hmm. what the already um, the, the speaker was uh, talking about. Uh, over. That's it from our side. And please feel free the the the, the team to to add in if I miss something. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, we really appreciate you touching on both those questions. We know it's a lot to discuss. Looking at the barriers um, on both on both counts around programming and coordination. Um, so please do feel free to add more to the Jamboard from your group. If you had any other ideas you wanted to share, these will your ideas and your thoughts will be shared with the Secretariat as well. Um, 
we, uh, we really appreciate everyone participating in this activity and in the session. And we hope that you did have some, some valuable discussions. Um, it's, it's sometimes difficult to end on, on barriers, but hopefully you also were able to, to sort of start discussing um, some ideas together as well. Um, I will pass it to Monica to uh, conclude us. And on my side, I just wanted to thank our uh, content leads today, um, Camilla Bulent and Hilal and Melike for your engaging presentations and for the work that you do. Thanks everyone. Over to you, Monica. Thanks, Laura. No, over to also like a great, great thank you to the content leads as well as the production uh, team that has been wonderful and has been very patient with us, break and rooms, Mentimeter and all that. And for you participants, and we feel that we could have been continued to discussing about this, that we were only Fun. starting now to get good Sorry. ideas. Yeah. Sorry, someone wants to speak. Ignore. Please carry on. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I just to say that thank you. And then uh, Laura is absolutely right. It feels a bit um, down to end it up in barriers, but I'm sure we also have lots of good ideas for mitigation, for improving, for like overcoming those barriers. And everything you say is going to be documented. Everything you say, we're going to take it back to reflect and hopefully to, to be, be able to, to be carried forward into the strategic plan and the, and the alliance um, strategic for the next few years and nothing just thank you again for your presentation and for you to continue to participate in the next uh, couple of days of discussions that we have ahead with the alliance and we send you a good afternoon evening morning wherever you are <laughs>